Zaytun, page 205. Zaytun was enjoying the cool water of his first shower in over a week. The water might shut off for good at any time, he knew, so he lingered for a few seconds longer than he should have. But he was ready to go. The neighborhoods were emptying out, and it would be long before there was no one else to help and little left to see. He wondered when and how he might leave. Maybe in a few days he could head up to Napoleon and St. Charles and ask the officers and aid workers there how he could get out. He would only need to get to the airport in New Orleans or Baton Rouge and then fly to Phoenix. There wasn't much left to do here. He was running low on food, and he missed Kathy and the kids. It was time. He walked down to of shares all year, he told Nassar. Zaytun called his brother Ahmad in Spain. Do you realize the images we're seeing on TV, Ahmad asked? As they were talking, he heard Nassar's voice from the porch. He was talking to someone outside. Zaytu Nasser called out. What? Zaytu asked. Come here, Nasser said. These guys want to know if we need water. Zaytu hung up the phone and walked toward the door. The men met Zaytu in the foyer. They were wearing mismatched police and military uniforms, fatigues, bulletproof vests. Most were wearing sunglasses. All had M16s and pistols. They quickly filled the hallway. There were at least ten guns visible. Who are you? One of the men asked. I'm the landlord. I own this house, Zaytu said. Now he saw that there were six of them, five white men and one African-American woman. Under their vest, it was hard to see their uniforms. Were they local cops? The woman, very tall, wore a camouflage fatigue. She was probably National Guard. They were all looking around the house as if they were finally seeing the inside of a building they had long been watching from afar. They were tense, each of them, and their fingers on the triggers. In the foyer, the officer was frisking Ronnie. Another officer had Nassar against the wall by the stairway. Give me your ID, one man said to Zaytun. Zaytun complied. The man took the idea and gave it back to Zaytun without looking at it. Get in the boat, he said. You didn't look at it, Zaytun protested. Move, another man barked. Zaytun was pushed forward at the front door. The other officers had already gathered Ronnie and Nassar onto an enormous fan boat. It was a military craft far bigger than any other boat Zaytun had since seen in the storm. There was at least two officers pointing automatic rifles at them. At that moment, another boat arrived. It was Todd, coming home from his rescue rounds. What's happening here, he asked. Who are you, one of the officers demanded. I live here, Todd said. I have proof. It's inside the house. Get in the boat, the officer said. Zaytun was not panicking. He knew there had been a mandatory evacuation in effect, and he assumed this had something to do with that. He knew all it it would all get straightened out wherever they were being taken. All he needed was to call Kathy, who would call a lawyer. But Hugo's number was in the house, by the phone on the hall table. If he didn't get in now, he would have no way to reach Kathy. He hadn't memorized it. Excuse me, he said to one of the soldiers. I left a piece of paper on the table. It's my wife's phone number. She's in Arizona. It's the only way. He moved toward the house, smiling politely. It was everything, that number. That piece of paper was 15 feet away. No, the soldier yelled. He grabbed the back of Zaytun's shirt, turned him around, and shoved him onto the boat. The four captives rode standing, surrounded by the six military personnel. Zaytun tried to figure out who they were, but there were few clues. Two of the three of the men were dressed in black, with no visible patches or insignia. No one spoke. Zaytun knew not to exacerbate the situation and assumed that when they were interviewed by a superior, everything would be explained. They would be scolded for staying in the city when there was a mandatory evacuation in effect, and they would be sent north on a bus or helicopter. Kathy would be relieved, he thought, when she heard he was finally on his way out. They sped down Claiborne and then Napoleon until the water grew shallow at the intersection of Napoleon and St. Charles. The boat cut its engine and coasted toward the intersection. There were a dozen men in National Guard uniforms there, and they all took notice. A smattering of other men in bulletproof vests, sunglasses, and black caps all looked up. They were waiting for them. The moment Saitun and the three other men were let off the boat, a dozen soldiers descended upon them. Two men in bulletproof vests leapt on Zaytun, tackling him to the ground. His face was pushed into the wet grass. He spat out mud. There was a knee in his back, hands on his legs. It felt like there were at least three men keeping him down with all their force. Though he had not moved or struggled, his arms were pulled behind his back, and he was handcuffed with plastic ties. His legs were tied together. All the white while the men were barking orders, Hold still! Stay there, motherfuckers! Don't move, asshole! Out of the corner of his eye, he could see the other three men, Nassar, Todd, and Ronnie, all on the ground, face down, with knees on their backs, hands on their necks. Photographers were taking pictures. Soldiers were watching, their fingers ready on the triggers of their guns. 
Struggling to gain their balance with their legs tied, the four men were lifted up. They were shuffled into a large white van. They sat on two benches inside opposite each other. No one spoke. A young soldier stepped into the driver's seat. His face seemed open. Zaytun took chance. What's happening here? Zaytun asked him. I don't know, the soldier said. I'm from Indiana. They waited for 30 minutes in the van. Zaytun could see the activity outside. Soldiers talking urgently to each other on the radios. This was a busy intersection that he had passed every day. He could see Copeland's restaurant, where he'd often eaten with his family, right there on the corner. Now it was a military post. He was a captive. He and Todd exchanged looks. Todd was a joker, and he'd had a run-in or two with a law. So even in the back of a military van, he seemed amused. He shook his head and rolled his eyes. Zaitun thought of the dogs he had been feeding. He caught the attention of one of the soldiers passing up the open back of the van. I've been feeding dogs, Zaitun said. Can I give you the address and you can take them out, bring them somewhere? Sure, the soldier said. We'll take care of them. You want the address, Zaitun asked. No, I know where they are, the soldier said and walked away. The van drove toward downtown. We're going to the Superdome, Todd wondered out aloud. A few blocks from the stadium, they pulled into the crescent-shaped driveway of the New Orleans Union Passenger Terminal, where incoming and outgoing Amtrak trains and Greyhound buses docked. Zaytun's earlier assumption that they were being evacuated before seemed to be confirmed. He was relieved and sat back on the bench. It was wrong that he hadn't been allowed to retrieve any possessions, and he felt that the treatment by the cops and soldiers had been rough, but the result was going to be simple and fair enough. They were being put on a bus or train and sat out of the city. Zaytun had picked up and dropped off friends and relatives at the station a handful of times over the years, fronted by a lush lawn and palm trees, and Union Pastor Terminal had opened in 1954, an Art Deco-style building once aspiring to grandness, but since overtaken by a certain gray municipal malice. There was a whimsical candy-colored sculpture on the lawn that looked like a bunch of child's toys glued together without reason or order. A few blocks beyond, the Superdome loomed. As they pulled to the side of the building, Zaytun saw police cars and military vehicles, National Guardsmen to hold the ground. The station had become a mil kind of military base. A few personnel were casual, talking idly against a Humvee, smoking. Others were on guard as if expecting a siege at any moment. The van stopped at the station side door, and the captives were taken out of the van and led inside. When Zaytun and the others entered the main room of the station, immediately fifty pairs of eyes, those of soldiers and police officers and military personnel, were upon them. There were no civilians inside. It was as if the entire operation, this bus station turned military base, had been arranged for them. Zaytun's heart was thrumming. They saw no civilians, no hospital no, or humanitarian aid workers, as had been common in areas like the Napoleon St. Charles staging ground. This was different. This was an entirely martial, and the mood was tense. Are you kidding me, Ted said? When the hell's going on? The four men were seated in folding chairs near the Greyhound ticket desk. With every passing minute, everyone in the bus station seemed to take more interest in Zaytun Nassar, Todd, and Ronnie. All around were men in uniform, New Orleans police, National Guard soldiers, prison guards, with the word Louisiana Department of Corrections on their uniforms. Zaytun counted about 80 personnel and at least a dozen assault rifles within a 30-foot radius. Two officers of the dogs kept watch, leashes wrapped tight around their fists. Todd was lifted from his chair and brought to the Amtrak ticket counter against the wall. As two officers flanked him, a third officer on this side other side of the counter began to question him. The other three men remained seated. Zaytun could not hear the interrogation. The soldiers and guards nearby were on edge. When Nassar shifted in his seat, there was immediate rebuke. S sit still. Go back to your position. Nassar at first resisted. Stop moving, they said. Hands where I can see them. Zaytun examined his surroundings. In essential ways, the station was still on the same. There was subway franchise, various ticket counters, and information kiosk, but there were no travelers. There were only men and women with guns, hundreds of boxes of water and other supplies stacked in the walls, and Zaytun and his fellow prisoners. Zaytun, Todd was arguing with his interrogator. Zaytun could hear occasional bursts as the questioning at the Amtrak desk continued. Todd was hot-headed on a normal day, so it didn't surprise Zaytun that he was agitated during the processing. Are you going to get a phone call? Todd asked. No, the officer said. You have to give us a phone call. There was no answer. Todd raised his voice, rolled his eyes, Soldiers around him stood closer, barking and admonitions and threats back at him. Why are we here? he asked a passing soldier. You guys are Al-Qaeda, the soldier said. Todd laughed traversely, but Zaytun was startled. He could not have heard right. Zaytun had long feared this day would come. Each of the few times he had been pulled over for a traffic violation, he knew the possibility existed. 
that he would be harassed, misunderstood, suspected of shadowy dealings that might bloom in the imagination of any given police officer. After 9-11, he and Kathy knew that many imaginations had run amok, that the introduction of the idea of sleeper cells, groups of would-be terrorists living in the U.S. and waiting for years or decades to strike, and that everyone at their mosque or the entire mosque itself might be waiting for instructions from their presumed leaders in the hills of Afghanistan or Pakistan. He and Kathy worried about the reach of the Department of Homeland Security, its willingness to contact anyone born in or with a connection to the Middle East. So many of their Muslim friends had been interviewed, forced to send in documents and hire lawyers. But until now, Zaytun had been fortunate. He had had no experience with profi profiling, hadn't been suspected of anything by anyone with real authority. There were the occasional looks of askance, of course, sneers from people upon hearing his accent. Maybe he thought this was just one soldier, ignorant or cruel, wanting to stir things up. Zaitun decided to ignore it. Still, Zaitun's senses were awakened. He scanned the room for more signals. He and the three others were still being watched by dozens of soldiers and cops. He felt like an exotic beast, a hunter's prize. Moments later, another passing soldier looked at Zaitun and muttered, Taliban. And as much as he wanted to dismiss both comments, he couldn't. Now, he was sure that there was a grave misunderstanding taking place, and that unraveling it, disproving it, and going to take days. Todd ranted, but Zaitun knew he would do no good. The question of their innocence or guilt would not be answered in this room, not any time soon. He sat back and waited. Before them was an alcove housing a bank of vending machines and video games. Above the machines, wrapping around the interior of the entire station, was a vast mural that occupied in four long segments the upper half of the station's main walls. In all, the mural was about 120 feet long, and it sought to depict the entire history of Louisiana in particular and the United States generally. Zaytun looked up at it and thought he had been in the terminal before. He had never really seen this mural. Now that he did, it was a startling thing, a dark catalog of subjugation and struggle. The colors were nightmares, the lines jagged, the images disturbing. He saw Ku Klux Klan hoods, skeletons, harlequins, and garish colors, painted faces. Just above him, there was a lion being attacked by a giant eagle made of gold. There were images of blue-clawed soldiers marching off to war next to mass graves. There were many depictions of the suppression of elimination of peoples, Native American slave immigrants, and always nearby was the artist's idea of the instigators, wealthy aristocrats in powdered wigs, generals in gleaming uniforms, businessmen with bags of money. In one segment, oil derricks stood below a flooded landscape, water engulfing a city. Nassar was pro process next. He was brought to the Amtrak ticket counter, and now Zaitu saw that they were fingerprinting and photographing each of them. Soon after Nassar's interrogation began, his duffel bag created a stir. A female officer was moving stacks of American money from the bag. This isn't from here, she said. Nassar argued with her, but this discovery only got the building more excited. This ain't from here, she said, now more certain. The money was laid out on a nearby table, and soon there was a crowd around. Somewhere count someone counted it, ten thousand dollars. This is the first Zaitun knew of the content of Nassar's bag. When Nassar had brought it onto the canoe, Zaitun had assumed it contained clothes, a few valuables. He never would have guessed it contained ten thousand dollars in cash. Soon there were more discoveries. Todd had been carrying $2,400 of his own. The officer stacked it on the table in its own pile next to Nassar's. In Todd's pockets, they found MapQuest printouts. I deliver lost luggage, Todd tried to explain. This didn't satisfy the officers. In one of Todd's pockets, they discovered a small memory chip, the kind used for digital cameras. Todd laughed, explaining that on it were only photos he'd taken of the flood damage, but the authorities were seeing something more. Watching the evidence on the table mount, Zaytun's shoulders slackened. Most municipal systems were not functioning. There were no lawyers in the station, no judges. They would not talk their way out of this. The police and soldiers in the room were too worked up, and the evidence was too intriguing. Zaytun settled in for a long wait. Todd grew more exasperated. He would calm down for a time, then explode again. Finally, one of the soldiers raised his arm as if to strike him down with the back of his hand. Todd went quiet. Then it was Zaytun's turn for processing. He was brought to the Amtrak counter and fingerprinted. He was pushed against a nearby wall on which height markers had been written by hand from five to seven feet. Zaytun had stood in the exact place for a while 
waiting to buy train tickets for friends or employees. Now, while handcuffed and guarded by two soldiers with M16, his photograph was being taken. At the ticket counter, he surrendered his wallet and was frisked for uh, any other possessions. He was asked basic questions, name, address, occupation, county of origin. He was not told of the charges against him. Eventually, he was brought back to the row of chairs and was seated again with Todd and Nassar while Ronnie was processed. Moments later, Zaytun was grabbed roughly under the arm. Stand up, a soldier said. Zaytun stood and was led by three soldiers into a small room, some kind of utility closet. Inside, there were bare walls and a small folding table. The door closed behind him. He was alone with two soldiers. Remove your clothes, one asked. Here, he asked. The soldier nodded. Until this point, Zaytun had not been charged with a crime. He had not been read his rights. He did not know why he was being held. Now he was in a small white room while being asked by two soldiers, each of them in full camouflage and holding automatic rifles to remove his clothes. Now one of the old soldiers barked. Zaiji took off his t-shirt and shorts and after a pause stepped out of his sandals. And the undershorts, the same soldier said, Zaiji paused. If he did this, he would live with it always. The shame would never leave him, but there was no alternative. He could refuse, but if he did, there would be a fight. More soldiers, some Sort of retribution. Do it, the soldier ordered. Zaitun removed his underwear. One of the soldiers circled him, lifting Zaitun's arms as he passed. The soldier had a bat bat baton, and when he reached Zaitun's back, he tapped Zaitun's inner thigh. Spread your legs, the soldier said. Zaitun did so. Elbow on the ta elbows on the table. Zaitun couldn't understand the meaning of the words. The soldier repeated the directive, his voice more agitated. Put your elbows on the table. He had no op options. Zaitun knew that the soldier would get what they wanted. They were likely, likely looking for any contraband, but he also knew that anything was possible. Nothing on his day had conform, conformed to any precedent. As I team bent over, he heard the sound of the soldier pulling plastic gloves into onto his hands. I team felt fingers quickly exploring his rectum. The pain was extreme but brief. Stand up, the soldier said, removing the glove with a snap. Get dressed. Zai team put on his shorts and shirt. He was led out of the room where he saw Todd. He was arguing already, threatening lawsuits, the loss of all their jobs. Soon, Todd was pushed into the room. The door was closed, and his protestations were muffled protestations were muffled behind the steel door. When Todd's search was complete, the two of them were led back through the bus. Zaitun was certain that he saw a handful of looks of recognition, soldiers and police officers who knew what he had, what had happened in the room. Zaitun and Todd were brought to the back of the station and toward the doors had, that led the buses and trains. Zaitun's thoughts were a jumble. Could it be that after all that, they were being evacuated? Perhaps they had been stripped to ensure that they hadn't stolen anything, and now deemed clean, they were being sent away on a bus? It was bizarre, but not out of the realm of possibility. But when the guards pushed open the doors, Zaitun took a quick breath. The parking lot where a dozen buses might normally be parked had been transformed into a vast, vast outdoor prison. Chain link fences topped by razor wire had been erected into a long 16 foot high cage extending about 100 yards into the lot. Above the cage was a roof, a freestanding shelter like those at a gas station. The barbed wire extended to meet it. Zaitun and Todd were brought to the front of the cage a few feet back from the back of the bus station, and a different guard opened the door. They were pushed inside. The cage was closed, then locked with a chain and a padlock. Down the way, there were two other prisoners, each alone in their own enclosure. Holy shit, Todd said. Zaitun was in disbelief. It had been a dizzying series of events, arrested at gunpoint in a home he owned, brought to an impromptu military base inside a bus station, accused of terrorism, and locked in an outdoor cage. It surpassed the most real accounts he'd heard of, third world law enforcement. Inside the cage, Todd ranted and swore. He couldn't believe it, but then again, he noted, it was not unprecedented. During Mardi Gras, when the local jails were full, the New Orleans police often housed drunks and thieves in temporary jails set up in tents. This one, though, was far more elaborate and had been built since the storm. Looking at it, Zaitun realized that it was not one long cage, but a series of smaller divided cages. He had seen similar structures before on the properties of his clients who kept dogs. This cage, like those, was a single fenced enclosure divided into smaller ones. He counted 16. It looked like a giant kennel, and yet it looked even more familiar than that. It looked precisely like pictures he'd seen on Guantanamo Bay, like the complex, it was a vast grid of chain-link fence with few walls so that prisoners were visible to guard 
visible to the guards and each other. Like Guantanamo, it was outdoors, and there appeared to be nowhere to sit or sleep. There were simply cages in the pavement beneath them. The space inside Zaitun and Todd's cage was approximately 15 by 15 feet, and was empty but for a portable toilet without a door. The only other object in the cage was a steel bar in the shape of an upside-down U, cemented into the pavement like a bike rack. It normally served as a guide for the buses, parking in the lot for passengers forming lines. It was about 30 inches high, 40 inches long. Across from Zaitun's cage was a two-story building, some kind of Amtrak office structure. It was now occupied by soldiers. Two soldiers stood on the roof, holding M-16 and staring down at Zaitun and Todd. Todd raged, wild-eyed and protesting, but the guards could hear little of what he said. Even Zaitun, standing near him, could hear only muffled fragments. It was then that Zaitun realized that there was a sound, a heavy mechanical drone cloaking the air around them. It was so steady and unchanging that he had failed to notice it. Zaitun turned and realized the source of the noise. The back of their cage nearly abutted the train tracks, and on the tracks directly behind them stood an Amtrak train engine. The engine was operating at full power on diesel fuel, and Zaitun realized in an instant was generating all the electricity used for the station and the makeshift jail. He looked up at the monstrous gray machine, easily a hundred tons, adorned with small red, white, and blue logo, and knew that it would be with them, loud and unceasing, as long as they were held there. On guard was a, uh, one guard was assigned to them. He sat on a folding chair about ten feet in front of the cage. He stared at Zaitun and Todd, his face curious and disdainful. Zaitun was determined to get a phone call. He reached for the chain-link fence in front of them, intending to get the attention of an officer of some kind. He saw near the back door of the station. Todd did so, too, and was immediately set straight by the guard who had been assigned to watch them. Don't touch the fence, the guard snapped. Don't touch the fence? Are you kidding, Todd asked? But the soldier was not joking. You touch that fence again, I'll fuck you up. Todd has asked where they were supposed to stand. He was told they could stand in the middle of the cage. They could sit on the steel rack. They could sit on the ground. But if they touched the fence again, there would be consequences. There were a dozen other guards roaming behind the terminal. One walked by, led by a German shepherd. He made sure to pause meaningful, meaningfully at their cage, giving Zaitu and Todd a look of warning before moving on. Zaitu could barely stand. There was a stabbing pain in his foot. He had ignored until now. He took off his shoe to find his instep discolored. There was something wedged under his skin, some kind of metal splinter, he thought, though he couldn't remember where or when he'd gotten it. The area was purple in the center, ringed by white. He needed to clear out the splinter or the foot would get worse, and quickly. Zaidun and Todd took turns sitting on the steel rack. It was only wide enough for one person, so they traded ten-minute shifts. After an hour, the doors to the station burst open. Nassar and Ronnie appeared, escorted by three officers. Zaitun and Todd's cage was open, and Nassar and Ronnie were pushed inside. The cage was locked again. The four men were reunited. Under the rubble of the engine, the men compared their experiences thus far. All four had been strip-searched. Only Todd had been told why they were being held. Possession of stolen goods was the only charge mentioned, and none had been read their rights. None had been allowed to make a phone call. Nassar had tried to explain the cash he had in his knapsack. The police and soldiers were in the city to prevent the widespread looting everyone had heard about. Nassar, being equally concerned about the looting, had decided to keep his money, his life savings, with him. His interrogators did not accept this. Nassar had no luck explaining that legions of immigrants kept their money in cash, that trust in banks was tenuous. He explained that one reason a person in his position kept his money in cash was for the possibility, however remote, that he would be stopped, questioned, detained, or deported. With cash, he could hide it, keep it, direct its retrieval if he was sent away. The four men didn't know what would happen to them, but they knew they would spend the night in the cage. The Syrian names of Zaitun and Dayub, their Middle Eastern accents, the $10,000 cash, Todd's cash, and MapQuest print printouts, it all added up to enough evidence that the four of them knew that their predicament would be straightened out anytime soon. We're screwed, friends, Todd said. In the cage, the men had few options. They could stand in the center, they could sit on the cement, or they could lean against the steel rack. No one wanted to sit on the ground. The cement beneath them was filthy with dirt and grease. If they made a move toward the fence, the guards would yell obscenities and threaten retribution. For the first hours in the cage, Zaitun's overriding goal was to be granted a phone call. All the men had made the request repeatedly during processing, 
and had been told that there were no phones functioning. This seemed to be a f- be fact. They saw no one talking on cell phones or landlines. There was a rumor that satellite phones were working and that there was one phone connected to a fax line in the upstairs office of the bus station. Every time my guard passed, they begged for access to this or any phone. At best, they got shrugs and glib answers. Phones don't work, a guard told them. You guys are terrorists. You're Taliban. The, the day's light was dimming. Processing had taken three hours, and the four men had been in the cage for three more. They were given each small cardboard boxes with the words barbecue pork rib printed on the side. Inside was a set of plastic cutlery and a packet of cheese spread, two crackers, a packet of orange drink crystals, and a bag of pork ribs. There was military-style meals ready to eat. Zaitun told the guard that he and Nassar were Muslims and could not eat pork. The guard shrugged. Then don't eat it. Zaitun and Nassar ate the crackers and cheese and gave the rest to Todd and Ronnie. With the darkness coming, the sound behind them seemed to grow louder. Already he was tired, but Zaitun knew that the engine would ensure that none of them slept. He had worked on ships before in engine rooms, but this was louder than that, louder than anything he had ever known. In the glare of the floodlights, it resembled a great furnace, moaning and ravenous. We can pray, Zaitun said to Nassar. He had caught Nassar's eye, and he knew what he was thinking. They needed to pray. We were urged to do so five times a day, but Nassar was nervous. Would this arouse more suspicion? Would they be mocked or even punished for worshipping? Zaitun saw no reason not to do so, even while being held in an outdoor cage. We must, he said. If anything, he thought, they needed to pray more often and with great fervor. What about wudu? Nassar asked. The Quran asked that Muslims wash themselves before their prayers, and there was no means of doing so here. But Zaitun knew that the Quran allowed that if there was no water available, Muslims could use dust to cleanse themselves, even if only ceremonial. And so they did so. They took gravel from the ground and rubbed it over their hands and arms, their heads and feet, and they knelt and performed salat. Zaitun knew their prayers were arousing interest from the guards, but he and Nassar did not pause. As the night went black, the lights came on, floodlights from above and from the buildings opposite. The night grew darker and cooler, but the light stayed on, brighter than day. The men were not given sheets, blankets, or pillows. Soon there was a new guard on duty sitting on the chair opposite them, and they asked him where they were supposed to sleep. He told them that he didn't care where they slept as long as it was on the pavement where he could see them. Zaitun didn't care about the sleep this night. He wanted to stay awake in case a supervisor, some sort of lawyer, any civilian at all happened by. The other men tried to rest their heads on the pavement and the crooks of their arms. No one slept. Even when someone would find themselves in a place where they might be able to rest, the sound of the engine, its vibrations in the ground took over. There could be no sleep in this place. Somewhere in the small hours, Zaitun tried to drape himself over the steel rack, stomach down. He found a minute or so of rest this way, but it was a position he could not maintain. He tried to lean his back against it, arms crossed. It could not be done. Other guards occasionally walked by with their German shepherds, but the night was otherwise uneventful. There was only the face of the guard, his M-16 by his side, the floodlights coming from every angle, illuminating the faces of Zaitun's fellow prisoners, all drawn, exhausted, half-mad with fatigue and confusion.